Okay, I make that two minutes past four, so we shall begin. In the first place, a very warm welcome to this event, uh, Repair and Refuge, the Spirit of Stories, uh, with Marina Warner and myself. It's uh, great to see you all here today um, at this uh, Winter Tales Book Festival event, um, and, and it's a real pleasure, above all, to have Marina joining us. Marina Warner is an outstanding writer. <clears throat> she is the author of many, many books, books that span a, a, a range of genres. She writes novels, she produces literary criticism, historical works, she is a world authority on fairy tales. She's also, she also has two uh, titles of which I'm very jealous. She is a mythographer and a fabulist. I remember when I first encountered the term fabulist as a job description when I was a PhD student and uh, was working on some fairly obscure 19th century Dutch figures and found one who, whose job title was theologian and fabulist. And I remember from that time on feeling extremely jealous of anyone who could say, this is what I do. Um, Marina does this and is also a mythographer. She is an essayist and a journalist amongst many other things. Her most recent book is the critically acclaimed Inventory of a Life Mislaid, an unreliable memoir, which was published earlier this year with HarperCollins. Preparing for today's event with Marina has given me the pleasure of being able to read through a lot of her work and to get to do so as part of my ordinary paid employment, which has been wonderful. I would be quite happy if I could stage an interview with her every week here at New College and I could spend lots of more of my time reading her work. And um, spending this time reading through uh, her work from uh, academic articles in journals to a memoir to uh, works on fairy tales to the Arabian Nights and Cinderella um, to uh, work on um, modern day refugee experiences has led me to the view that Marina is a truly fascinating writer, uh, both in the breadth of her interests, uh, as I said, from genies in lamps and flying carpets to the present day struggles of refugees, but also a fascinating writer in the coherent set of very carefully studied intuitions and intellectual commitments that hold that broad range of interests together. And writers like that who produce uh, such a corpus are quite rare. So it's a real privilege to be able to hold a conversation with one such writer. Whatever the topic, when you read one of Marina's books, you know that you are reading Marina Warner. And that makes the work so stimulating. So we're delighted that she is able to join us today for the Winter Tales Book Festival. Um, to introduce myself very briefly, uh, I'm a far less interesting person and less interesting writer. Uh, I'm James Eglinton, I'm the Meldrum Senior Lecturer in Reformed Theology here at the School of Divinity at the University of Edinburgh. Um, to give some very brief housekeeping rules as well before we begin, um, masks are required to be worn throughout the event and also while you're moving about the building, uh, so please do that. We're also following government guidelines about track and trace, and your details have been gathered for that purpose. We do not plan to hold a fire alarm drill uh, over the next hour, so if the fire alarm were to sound, uh, please consider it the real deal, and make your way to the fire exits that are signaled around the hall. Hopefully that will not happen. Uh, and please maintain a reasonable distance from others at all times, and especially while you're leaving the building. And you will have seen helpers on hand who directed you into the hall this morning who will be there to direct you out as well. Um, so you can see some of uh, Marina's works up on the screen. Um, and now we have M Marina here as well. So welcome, Marina. It's lovely to see you today. Well, thank you so much for that very overgenerous uh, introduction. I'm delighted to be in Edinburgh, at least virtually. Well, we're very grateful for the technology that makes that possible. Um, so the the plan for the the session is that um, I've, Marina and I will have a, a conversation around some of her works, drawing out some of these themes. But we do also have time scheduled for um, 
for questions um, between the audience and Marina as well. Uh, but if I could get the ball rolling with one initial question. Um, I once heard you describe, um, Marina, um, novelists as people whose written corpus of work is really an exercise in mapping out their imagination. And I think I, I heard you say this in contrasting novelists with literary critics. Um, having tried to explore your written work um, to prepare for this, I've found memoir, uh, fairy tales, mythology, history, amongst many other things. Um, do you see your own work as mapping out your imagination as a writer? Could you talk us through what that process looks like for you? Yeah, I'm not sure that I am that self-conscious about what I'm trying to do. But what is certainly the experience of my life as a writer has been that one book or essay leads to another because it always leaves questions open. Um, and so, in a sense, though the books have different topics, the way I came to them was all interconnected. And, and it is, for me, in fact, including the fiction and the nonfiction, kind of one whole attempt to understand the role of imagination in our lives. Because I think that we underestimate, as a whole, our culture underestimates how much we are affected by unconscious processes that are dreams, um, fantasies, and experiences that we have not actually experienced. I mean, the example would be of a child now knowing exactly what a monster is, but of course they've never seen a monster. They've completely imbibed from now from cinema as well and from visual media. And I, I puzzle over the effect of this extraordinary, you know, the word for it is sort of phantasmagoria that goes on in our heads a lot of the time. And, I mean, there's both a sinister aspect to it, which we see a bit in politics, and now we see now on the internet, how much fantasy rules us. But it's also, of course, a tremendous resource. And one of our greatest, the greatest characteristics of our species, that we have this power to visualize what we have not actually directly seen. And that, that resource you know, can be fostered, developed in, in wonderful directions, and it's created some of the greatest works of art in every medium that we have. Mm. Right, well, so th I think that when you look at, or when we look at your written work as it has developed, um, it's very evident to see the sense in which the books lead on from one another in a way that is very imaginative, but then you can also see as the reader that imagination drives this and has a, a binding effect across your works that's, that's quite fascinating. And that has taken you from writing about the Arabian Nights to writing about, well, amongst many other things, to also writing about your own life um, or your, your own memoir and the story of, of your mother's life um, in, the, in the inventory of a life mislaid. The subtitle, well, the, the, t the main title is fascinating to talk about a life mislaid, but then the subtitle I find even more intriguing, an unreliable memoir. At least it's fascinating to me. Um, in my own work, I deal a lot with autobiography and um, deal with a very straight-laced historical guild that's quite demythologized and is a demythologizing power, which is very concerned with sifting through people's recollections of their own lives and their memoirs in order to sort out what we can really say is reliable and what's much less reliable. Yeah. Um, and yet you draw the, the accent and also the reader's eye to this element of unreliability on the front cover. Um, could you talk us through that word choice? Um, I know that quite often well, authors don't have too much say in this because publishers um, can, can bend your arm a bit with the titles of, of no, books. No, no, it was my title, mm. actually. So, and, and I decided to, to draw attention to the fact that it was a memoir because I originally began it as a novel, but for various reasons, I wanted that sort of shiver of the truth to be present in the work, because the story, in some ways, is probably a bit banal if you did it as a fiction. You know, a poor girl in southern Italy marries an English gentleman officer and then is not very happy in her new life. <laughs> and in some sense, I mean, I possibly could have brought it off as a fiction or someone else better than I am at novels could have done so. But actually, I wanted that frisson of the fact that this was all real material. 
but it was being remembered by somebody who, myself, who was only six when the book ends. So there was no way that my memories were going to be adequate to exploring this early years of my parents' marriage and their misadventures and adventures in Cairo, where they went to live after the war, and my father opened a bookshop. And so, um, and I had a lot of archive material, so there was what you were talking about, the historical record. The historical record in autobiographies will be subjective. I mean, you know that too. And the, and the, and the same, same event recounted by two different witnesses will often seem very different. And this has been something that we've known about human nature for a very long time. And certainly cognitive psychologists now you know, very much understand this, that witness and testimony based on me eyewitness memory are nevertheless inconsistent very frequently of the same event. It's a problem in law courts, but it's an experiential existence for us. It's not a, it's the way we are. So, but at the same time, you know, I wanted the real people in the book too to be real because they had a kind of purchase. They were, you know, my father was the son of the, well, a very famous man at the time because he was the captain of the England cricket team. So he had, as a child, as a little child, he had a gilded upbringing in the, in the public eye. You know, might, they would go to tea with the king in the palace, this kind of thing. So he'd had a very distorted view of what lay in store for him because there wasn't any money in cricket. Um, and so this, but it was more interesting in the book to have my totally unreliable memories of my grandfather <laughs> as a real person than it would have been to invent a, a kind of glamorous cricketer, which would again be rather banal, I think. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 they were the reasons. And also I wanted to draw attention to memory work as a kind of dream state. And you know, when I started, when I started the book, I wrote down all my memories of being a child in Egypt before the age of six. There were only 10 of them. And I tried to write them as vividly as I could. And then when I started looking at the archives and so forth, when I looked at my parents' letters, and I found that many, many things I'd got wrong. I mean, for example, I remember being very, very fond of my nanny, my Egyptian nanny. But it turns out from the records of my, that my parents kept that I had three, three different women. But they were completely, in my mind, they completely conversion to one most lovable person. <laughs> so, you know, that's, and, but there were many other ways that I found that mm. I had remembered things, even though they were, came up in my mind's eye with utter clarity, crystalline clarity. But nevertheless, they were sort of inventions. Actually, I have a quote which I really like, which I think points to the importance of the memoir side. Um, and that is, I, I, I'll open my PowerPoint if that's all right. Yes, please do, please do. Yes, okay. So um, this, this is the quote. Wounds heal on the body, but in the archive, they always stay open. And that, I wanted to capture that sharpness of memory, even when they're not necessarily accurate, that they, they are a, true experiences that somebody had at one time. This is the wound that's open. And one of the things I found in the material that my parents left behind um, was this present tense of those experiences. The letters are written in the moment when it's happening. My father wrote endless letters from the war front on the African campaign as he was approaching Italy where he met my mother and so forth. I mean, there were, and, and this is the, the way it springs from the past as fresh as if it was happening in that very moment. I mean, that's what you encounter in your chronicles and, um, and your, uh, the autobiographical materials you're reading in history. It's that freshness of the the freshness of the memory that leaps out of the archive and often, often is, is painful. Um, I just, I, I, I'll, I'll skip a little bit. I, this, I just want to show you some of the pictures of my mother because uh, I also wanted to capture her reality, uh, her actual presence. That's her on the left as a little girl. They were orphan children. They, um, the, 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 their father had died, so they had a difficult time. They look very well set up here, but they actually have struggled. Um, there she is. You see, she was blessed with very, very appealing looks. And that's what she used to escape from a difficult situation in fascist Italy. Um, there's my father, who's 15 years older than her. 
Um, it was a very unlikely marriage. That's the, that's, that's the champion cricketer, um, <laughs> Plum Warner. I don't know if any of you know of him. He was a very famous man in his day. There she is. I, this is the photograph I gave for the flyer for the shirt for the um, event, because I think there's an element of fairy tale in the story. It's not just imposed by me. It was a sort of poor girl encountering, through her beauty, rises in society and tries to adapt. And this, all this beautiful material that she's wearing was bought by my father on the black market in Naples. Very, very difficult to get that kind of thing in absolute war-torn, totally damaged Italy. And then she became very stylish. She was, as it were, groomed into you know, being a society lady. Um, I'll, I'll stop sharing because I know that um, James has questions. <laughs> Thanks. Well, thank you for sharing the pictures. They're um, really fascinating to see. Um, one of the well, uh, things that struck me in reading through your, your work was uh, at one point there's a line in D.H. Lawrence, never trust the artist, trust the tale. And you are very critical of that in one particular writing, because you say that he fails to see how intertwined the teller and the tale always are. Um, and that very much comes across also in what you were just saying in how the memoir takes shape as well. Um, and then also in this idea of unreliability, but that's not necessarily a problem. Um, could you talk to us about the role of imagination then in memoir writing or in historical writing in general um, and you might, this might be a good occasion then to, we could look at some of your pictures on objects as well, because ordinary objects play a very important role in how you write about um, imaginative writing across history. When we're thinking of the Arabian Nights, then we're thinking of lamps and carpets. Uh, mm -hmm. But then in your own memoir writing as well, it's very imaginative, but grounded in these um, real historical objects or our everyday objects. Yes, well, thank you. <clears throat> well, trust the teller, not the tale. Is, um... I mean, it's my way around of, of D.H. Lawrence's. And that's because I got very interested in women's role in telling stories. Um, because I felt it made a difference that fairy tales, for example, while they had been much collected by men, including Andrew Lang, not very far from you. He, he um, was a great collector of stories. But he, when he collected them, he actually gave them to women to write up. So the team of women writers who produce the Rose Fairy Book, the Brown Fairy Book, et cetera. Um, and that's quite a pattern in them. Um, this role of women, the voices of women, the association of women with fairy tales. And it seems to me that that makes a difference to how we receive the stories because it, it, it attaches them to real life experience. So when you have these wicked stepmothers and quarreling sisters and cruel old women, and, and you also have powerful old women and all that is actually, what does, it, what does it mean that women tell these stories? And so that's one of the questions that I have asked all my life, because they seem to be superficially misogynist, which would be strange. Why would women tell stories against women? But at the same time, if you, you know, go deeper into them, you find that there are reasons and there's wisdom there that's being passed on. And so, for example, with the wicked stepmother, uh, this is usually because when women died in childbirth, as they often did, the new, the new woman, the new wife, would prefer to have her own household and wouldn't want to inherit neither the children nor perhaps the helpers, the nurse or whatever, and would try to cast them out. So there's a, that, that's, there's a sort of reality that the magic is trying to remedy and repair a, a kind of streak of, of, of tragedy that, go, that runs through the structures of society in much more in the past than now, because fortunately, death in childbirth, though it happens more often than it should, doesn't happen on the scale that it used to happen. On, on the question of the objects, which is um, very much the structure of inventory, because of course it is an inventory of objects, I'll, I'll show you some of them. So, um, uh, so things that speak. I'm a very, I, I inherited not only some archival material, like this tragic little um, uh, postcard from my father when he was six and sent to boarding school, and my, my or seven, 
one of my arguments about him, or not an argument, but one of my kind of way I characterize him is that he was sort of brutalized by being endlessly sent to these schools, which is t t totally traditional for his class in England, but not a good idea. And then, um, and then I had a, a sort of handful of objects that obviously came from Egypt from their time there, from 1947 to 52. So this was my father's cigarette tin, uh, the kind of cigarettes he smoked, which of course is very evocative for me. I remember the smell of them. I also remember how he would leave the cigarette just burning on his lip and the ash would fall off. Um, I would watch this as a child. But anyway, so the Dimitrino is also, uh, cigarettes is also part of the kind of world of Egypt because Dimitrino is a kind of Italian name or perhaps Greek. And so it was that world of cosmopolitan world. Then there was his camera, many shots, many photographs still, but, uh, but also this canister of film, which as you see says W.H. Smith, his bookshop was owned by W.H. Smith. And this was one of the, the moments which was a genie in the lamp kind of moment, because I unscrewed it and I found inside it two rolls of negative film, which I took to the chemist to have uh, developed. And, and I found that on the outside, were the photographs he took of my mother on their honeymoon in 1944. The German line had just retreated north of Ravello, the famous beauty spot on the sea. And, um, and he went, and he describes this in his letters actually to his parents. He had a jeep and he took her to Ravello. And there she is looking young and happy. And, and on the inside of that coil of film was, was a shots of Cairo burning in 1952, which was when in the uprising against British influence and rule, sort of rule. It was, wasn't meant to be ruling, but they sort of were. Um, the, uh, there was a massive riot and arson, and most of downtown so-called European Cairo was burnt, including the bookshop. So that was an example of, a, of an object which detonated like a kind of bomb. I mean, it was this tiny, inconspicuous, sort of nothing thing, tin canister, but inside it, was all the, these potent stories uh, and twisted round one another, which was very affecting to me. Um, and then my, my, you know, my mother's clothes, I think any of you who've had a parent who dies knows the extraordinary poignancy of their clothes and their spectacles and that, all that kind of thing. It's very, very heartbreaking to have to clear out how the cupboards. And um, I found in one of the cupboards um, the pair of shoes that was, I think, a sort of wedding present my father gave her, um, because they were handmade, rather expensive in those days, and would be now too. Um, and she always referred to them as brogues. In fact, people don't think they're brogues now, they think they're Oxfords, because they don't have broguing on them. And also now brogues, which are very fashionable again, are um, very heavy and clumpy. And so these are rather delicate for brogues. But nevertheless, um, it took me down a sort of pathway. I, I felt these shoes were like the glass slipper. They were English shoes made in England by bespoke shoemakers for country walks, for the golf course, and perhaps not the golf course, but for the grouse moor, for the point to point. You know, they were kind of an, imag an imagination of life that they were going to live together. This was her 22nd birthday around the time they got married. Um, they were going to live together when she was going to be an Englishwoman. No one in Italy ever wears this kind of shoe. So she, this was a transplantation for her. And it was, as I said, the glass slipper which made her into my father's wife. So that, and that I have a, 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 quite a long chapter, which I much enjoyed writing actually, about how these shoes speak. And they speak in brogue, but that brogue is a, is a, is a kind of language of a certain place, time, class, interests, ambitions, aims, that, and very, very um, unlike like anything in Italy. And Peyton Paperim, that's just my father used to love that and eat it all the time. So this is the wonderful, I have wonderful drawings by my friend Sophie Herxana, who's a poet and an artist. And she added these wonderful vignettes. So this was the hot water bottle my mother needed because the first winter she came to England after the war ended was the coldest on record, 1946 to seven, which is when I was born. So, now that's the bookshop. We can go, we can leave mm. again. <laughs> fascinating, fascinating. Um, I think in how you develop your work in this regard, concrete objects um, 
rooted in history and yet um, narratival and imaginative. Um, it, it seems to show that the boundary between what we could call mythology or imagination and history is maybe a, a bit more artificial than we often imagine. Mm -hmm. And you also seem quite deliberate in blurring any kind of absolute boundary between what we could call fiction and what we might call non-fiction. Do you think that the boundaries that you're trying to push against um, or demonstrate that, you know, that they're really quite artificial, are they distinctively British boundaries? And I ask this question because you, you do write from a, a British perspective, but also you have a very cosmopolitan story and can think about this from different languages, for example. Um, in my own research, for, um, I work a lot with Dutch sources and Dutch historical sources, and Dutch doesn't have one word for history, it has two. Um, geschiedenis, which is a catch-all word for every single thing that has happened, and also history, which is a subjective narratival account of some of the things that have happened that have been put together with a particular meaning with the same distinction in german for example um, but it's quite a hard distinction to render in one word in english you immediately have to start unpacking that there are different ways to think about history as very objective and capacious and very subjective and uh, much more limited in scope um, how do you approach that when you think about um, history well actually i mean English is a little bit richer than, say, Italian or French, in which the word for story is him, as the word for history, la storia o l'histoire. So that, and that perhaps admits something that you're, you've put your finger on. But actually, what happened over, is that when I first started writing about myths and legends and things, um, I was a deconstructionist. It was back in the 70s. And I was demythologizing. My book on the Virgin Mary is a, is a critique that is de deconstructive in, 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 in approach. And, um, but actually, what I then found gradually is that, is that it's actually it's very difficult to replace mythology with something, actually. So, for example, the, the Age of Reason you know, it's now been frequently blamed for some of the worst excesses of fantasy in negative fantasy, destructive fantasy in the 20th century, such as fascism, um, because they were supreme, well, they, they actually were occultists as well in Germany, but nevertheless, on the whole, it was seen as extremely rational, bureaucratic, legalistic, and so forth, um, and led to this, you know, simply appalling, fantastic rule of the and we see that now a little bit with fake news and so forth, with this conspiracy theories. They, 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 they don't, the, the people there claim, the, the believers claim these, these are, this is reason that's taking them there. So it's a very difficult problem about the way we are, our psyches. And um, my, I began, I think, when I'd read a book called Phantasmagoria, which was all about scientific attempts to understand spirits and ghosts and telepathy and so forth. And it made me realize that what we need is to have stories that our imagination can be nurtured by that don't take us in these dangerous directions. We need to, f because we can't actually strip ourselves of this imaginative myth-making faculty. We seem to be doomed the way we are made to make to do this. Uh, and uh, no, any appeals to reason have not worked in the past. I'm not denying that reason exists, and I'm actually you know, a fairly rational person, actually. <laughs> but, um, well, I think I am. But, um, but, um, but I, I do, and I'm not a believer, so I have to say that. I, I, I was a Catholic, and I used to believe intensely when I was young. So I know the experience of faith, but I no longer have that. And, um, and so I've sort of, I know what it's like to be someone who believes. And I don't believe in fairies, uh, though um, I have often been accused of it, <laughs> and, um, including by Melvin Bragg. <laughs> but, um, but I do believe in the powers of imagination to create realities, and that power needs to be perfected in the right direction. It's quite a claim to fame from, uh, from Melvin Bragg. <laughs> um, but, well, let's talk about fairy tales then. So um, I, I heard a lot of fairy tales when I was a child, and, um, and love well, the whole you're experience. Lucky. You're very lucky. But then they, they dropped out of my you know, active reflection on how to live life, pretty much, I would say, until I had children. 
and then rediscovered a lot of fairy tales. So once reading a, a fairy tale to one of my children, and, uh, and my mother was there and asked, oh, where did you learn that fairy tale? And I said, yeah, of course, you, well, you, you, taught it, you taught me this fairy tale a few decades before. But something that I found very striking about uh, your work on fairy tales is that you push against the popular assumption that fairy tales are just simple and childish. And actually, you, you're a very lucid expositor of the profundity of fairy tales and actually how much they matter to adults as well on, on many different levels. Um, so could you tell us in the first place, what is a fairy tale? Um, and, and then why they matter, uh, not just to children, but to the people, to those children for the rest of their lives as well. Well, a fairy tale is a, t tends to be now a short, a short story of, of marvelous things um, with elements of the supernatural with a happy ending, this is not always the case, but nevertheless, t tending to driving towards a happy resolution. Um, they ha carry with them, even when written, a memory of voice. So even when they are actually composed by someone like Hans Christian Andersen in a very literary high style, they nevertheless claim to be originating with a popular, anonymous popular source that goes back in time. So they're a, a communal form of culture, something that we share and, and that is defined by the fact that we share because it isn't defined as having originated with a genius somewhere at a certain point in time, but of being kind of, you know, the, one of the metaphors is an ocean of stories. So we, we, we are all, you know, swimming and floating in an ocean of stories and we share that in common. So I will be able to recognize an Icelandic saga's motifs or a Tibetan motif, or an Australasian motif. And, and it is actually quite interesting how many preoccupations do turn up in similar guises, um, partly because the fairy tales are about the great experiences of life. They're about parental love or not. They're about losing parents. They're about sibling rivalry. They're about passionate romantic love. And so they, these are common to the human species, so they turn up in different forms, but recognizably so. So it's, a, so it's a language that joins us together. But there is another aspect of, that I feel is important to the definition of fairy tale, and that is that it isn't a single, it isn't only a single object. It isn't only a tale. Fairy tale is also an atmosphere. Mode. I mean, Addison, Joseph Addison said, there's the fairy way of writing. And I like that very much. The fairy way of writing is going beyond realism seeing, you know, the, going, uh, throwing, fling, flinging open the charmed magic casements that T T Keats talked about. So it's, an, it's a scenery, and, a, and, a, and, and that scenery is characterized by enchantment. So that scenery contains giants, ogres, uh, goblins, fairies, rusalkas. Uh, it depends on which culture you're in, but there's always invisible beings who have power to do good, harm, or just simply laugh. Sometimes they just mock humans. <laughs> but, so it's, it's, uh, and they can be found, these, these usually under the ground or in the or above. So then they're, they're terrestrial. If they're terrestrial, they're sub subterranean. You have marvelous stories in Scotland, absolutely marvelous stories about fairy hills. And they don't necessarily have a story attached to them. I mean, they might write stories about people disappearing into the fairy hill living there for seven years and thinking it's only five minutes when they come out, everything's changed. But, um, but actually, fairy hills are just part of the landscape, and that's also a fairy tale. Um, if we could ask you, what are your three favorite fairy tales? <laughs> As someone yes, well, who knows them all. <laughs> oh, I wish I did know them all. Well, I, I'm very fond of the Arabian Nights, and, and I was thinking what is, I mean, some of my favorites are not often in the collections, but one that is always in the collection are the three dervishes' tales. Um, the three one-eyed dervishes each tell a tale, and each tale is about a transgression of some kind that they've committed, for which they've been punished by losing an eye. Um, these are not really children's stories, but, but children would enjoy them. But the second dervishes' tale is when our hero, Prince, is turned into a monkey. But he's a very clever monkey, and he knows how to read and write. So he gets taken on as a scribe by another potentate. But the, um, his, the daughter of the potentate, 
is actually a jinnia, so she's an enchanted being. And when she comes into the room and sees the scribe working beside her father writing, she puts on her veil and says, Father, why have you let me into a room where there is a man? And the, and the father says, where's this man? This is a monkey. She says, no, he's a man. Anyway, then he has to be disenchanted. And she is the agent of his disenchantment in a fantastic battle with the powers of evil. But unfortunately, which is, makes it a very good story, she uses up all her powers in trying to defeat the evil genie who's turned him into a monkey. And she's consumed by the flames in their fire, so she dies. But he is turned, she saves. A lot of the fairy tales I like are about young girls saving men. <laughs> I liked them when I was a child, and I still quite like them. So one of them is the six swans, which many of you will know, where the daughter, sister, um, rescues her brothers who've been turned into swans or sometimes ravens by knitting and she has to knit in some horrible you know terrible nettles or thistles or something and she knits and knits and knits these shirts to help them change back into men and sometimes they're swans too but she was just before the, the just before she's going to be burnt to death she's rescued but she hasn't finished the last sleeve on the last shirt and so one of her brothers remains with a raven's wing or a swan's wing. I loved that story when I was young. You wanted me to give you three. Well, I think the Snow Queen is a wonderful story. I love the Snow Queen. That's also got a heroine who goes through thick and thin to save Kai, who's been, as you know, enchanted, cruelly enchanted by having a splinter of ice in his eye from the Snow Queen's mirror, which makes him see everything ugly and evil in the world and nothing good. But he gets saved by Gerda. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, something that I found very, uh, really interesting in looking at your analysis of what constitutes a fairy tale is the, the role of the fairy tale in forming a hope. And you, uh, so a fairy tale is something that doesn't require belief on the part of the listener and as you've said, and you've written before at various points, we don't expect the child who hears the tale to believe in magic beans or beanstalks or giants like that. Um, and yet these tales that require a suspension of belief and, and, a, and a, a very in, incredulous kind of metaphysic, you know, we don't expect the children to buy into that. And yet the suspension of belief seems tied to the capacity to give hope in the fairy tale. Mm. Um, when I read your analysis of that, um, it made me think immediately as a, as a Christian theologian of how in, in Christian theology, as I understand it, um, there's a requirement of belief in, in a very grand set of metaphysical claims. And then the capacity for Christian hope as a virtue is tied to the engagement of belief rather than, than its suspension. Um, I wonder if you could talk to us briefly about how those two approaches to b belief or uh, incredulity and hope uh, works. Um, do you well, understand the, 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 the um, fairy tale is offering quite a different kind of hope? Um, yes, it is. I mean, the, 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 the relig Christian um, perspective looks to eternity and to salvation in eternity, and often the promise is that even if you suffer in this life, you will be rewarded in eternal life. Uh, so that the, the, and the eschatology of um, religion you know, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a, in the long durée, it's very, very long perspective. And it's compensatory by this sense that something in the future will be, will be just. Fairy tale is much, much more practical and much more down to earth. It wants the reward here and now, and it promises that it will be here and now. And of course, it's much more bloodthirsty than, I mean, religions usually aren't so bloodthirsty. I mean, tyrants, the evil stepmother in the Snow White dances in her red hot, she puts on red hot shoes and dances till she drops. Well, okay, you know, the imagination of hell has definitely included such things. But on the whole, that's not how a preacher, you wouldn't preach that from me. <laughs> <laughs> so, but um, so fairy tale has this sort of gritty, uh, short-term perspective, 
that the mighty will be cast down now, tomorrow, today. Um, in a fairy tale, we wouldn't have Trump. He would have long ago been put in a spiked barrel and rolled downhill. <laughs> so, so, so there's this, uh, and this, of course, you, it, I mean, it is funny. That, that, that there's also that. One must not forget that. There's a, the defiance of the hope in fairy tale is kind of ironical and humorous. Very, very often, the traditional storyteller will end the story saying, well, they went and lived for happily ever after in a fine castle with everything they had to eat, but we sit here sucking our teeth with nothing to eat. So there's a kind of earthy, defiant comedy in the hopefulness of fairy tale. Um, it kind of knows that it's actually not going to happen like that. It's the satisfaction is of an emotional, of an improbable emotional, is the potential that is not actually thought of to be true. I mean, they're true, they're true to feelings and they're true to many circumstances um, of people's lives in terms of poverty and famine and uh, suffering and uh, all these things are, are very truthful. But the spirit that moves them is one that is one of rebellion while knowing that the rebellion is very unlikely to succeed. Uh, That's so, my feeling about it. So you've mentioned already that fairy tales are present in so many different cultures. Um, and actually something that seems to run throughout all of your work is, is a distinct kind of claim about humans and anthropology that humans are story-driven mm. creatures, um, that story seems to be ubiquitous amongst human cultures. Um, although maybe you could correct me on that if there are any story-free cultures out there, but it seems like it would be very dehumanizing to lose story altogether and that we seem to need it in some sense. Um, what's your take on why humans are um, creatures for whom story is so important? Uh, I think even. that from the very beginning, I mean, all the, all, every culture in the world has an attempt, attempt to answer what the stars are, for example. I mean, looking up at the skies, what the moon is, the sun, the tides, all the elements, um, how they interact with destiny, what death is, what happens to the dead. Actually, when Christopher Columbus first arrived in the Caribbean, he left one of his uh, shipmates, when, well, shipmates, an actual priest. He left him on the island and he told him, find out what they believe about what happens in the heavens and what happens to the dead and how, um, well, there was one, a third one, I forget now, but that, he, he knew that this was you know, something that every culture actually does. And the only way to answer those questions is by stories. I mean, until we have scientific, now we have scientific um, methods and telescopes and so forth, but that's very, very short period of time in terms of, and we're still finding out things in, in those scientific ways. But I think it's rather a loss that we give stars now, new stars, the names of numbers, and we give them by numbers rather than giving them poetic names. I think we could try and narrativize what we discover a bit more. I mean, there's a, there's a social function too. I mean, the, the, for millennia, we know this from the written records, people have told each other stories. When, when um, the, the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is one of the earliest works of literature we have, we have begins with Gilgamesh saying, it begins with the writer of the of this epic saying, that Gilgamesh has all decreed that his story be written down in tablets. So we have, the, in the first work of literature, we actually know it's, it's, it's stipulated that this is a story that's been told that as the king has now said must be written down. There are many, many questions that I would love to continue asking um, about your thoughts on story and what it means to be human. But I wonder if, for a final question on my part, um, if I could ask you to tell us a bit more about your current project uh, and using story in relation to refugees. 
Well, this began in, in 2015, I think, when there was a huge concern. I mean, you will remember, I mean, there's still a huge concern, but there were great numbers coming across the Mediterranean and arriving on Lampedusa, mostly in Sicily. And I happened to be in Sicily quite a lot around that time. I, I had a book translation to Italian. And, and anyway, I got very caught up in it. And, and um, the, 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 the young people who arrive always ask to tell their stories, to give the witness statement. And they will have to stick to it if they get to get asylum. They mustn't be inconsistent in any particular, otherwise the asylum claim will be thrown out. And um, it seemed to me that for young people, this was very limiting. And so we started trying to do story workshops in which we invented stories. I'll just show you, I'll show you um, some pictures. Um, it's still going on, but we've been interrupted by the um, pandemic, of course. Um, but we've tried to, that's the bookshop. That's me, I'll skip these. <laughs> so, um, sorry, I'll skip all this. <laughs> um, this is all from the book. But then this is, so this is the group of people, you know, and they've all, these are all the countries they've come from. It means my land is where I place my feet. So they've come from all these amazing places. And, um, and then we would take them for walks in, in Palermo. They weren't shy of being in the city in the center of the city, they weren't sure, you know, what, how people would receive them. So they, it was a good exercise to take them around and for them to see the city. And we supplied pencil and papers. And then we made, they made maps, sort of story maps of what their walk had been. And this was very successful. They loved doing this. And then we would also try and turn elements of what they'd seen into stories. So they began creating um, story boards um, and stories, and we're going through it very quickly. Um, and, and then once they'd created these storyboards from the stories they'd invented from what they'd seen in the city, um, we perform created this sort of banner that, and then um, they, oh, sorry. And then they would perform it. Um, I thought I had a photograph of them performing it, but perhaps not. So sorry, that's it. Fascinating. Um, we do have, um about 10 minutes or so for questions from the audience. This is your chance to ask Marina Warner. Yes, uh, so a microphone will be brought over. Thank you very much. That's, I've heard you speak before and I just find everything so fascinating. Um, and I'm hoping that you can make me feel a little more positive but in our present culture, when everything for children is so much more visual and so fixed, it feels to me that people's that the imagination is not having so much room. Because if you see a picture of a monster exactly drawn like that monster, it, it's kind of limiting. And I wonder if you feel that's, that's a sort of negative cultural influence. I'm not, if you see what I mean. Well, I do, I do feel that rather, I'm afraid. I, I, I'm sad that something like you know, Disney Corporation's saturation marketing means that the Little Mermaid, even in my mind's eye, you know, and I've tried to resist this, comes up as Ariel uh, with the sort of slightly, you know, cutified look. So it, it is, you know, it is difficult. I, I don't even know you know, what I think about some of the cartoons that children really love. I mean, my grandson really loves Peppa Pig. But I, and, and I do w wonder about that. And it's true that children today don't seem to have the same capacity just to listen without pictures. Um, but on the other hand, I would say positively that um, the rise of materials for children has been very, and there are wonderful, wonderful things that can be um, you know, bought or shown to children now, and some marvellous children's illustrators and very, very good children's writers, actually. And many, many of them. I think the problem of, that you've put your finger on uh, becomes much more acute with teenagers. I think, I mean, I think there isn't, there are young adult novels now and so forth, but they tend to be very realistic, or tend to be very, uh, well, not 
not very emancipatory in some ways. They, they tend to look at the problems that young adults have. And that's comforting and cathartic for young adults to read such things. But um, it's still, I think the, there's, a, there's a gap there. Um, and that's where the social media trap is most, they're most vulnerable to the social media trap. And so far, that, that, that does, there doesn't seem to be any ways of, of really resisting that. I mean, I have friends who have endless battles with their children about their phones. It seems to be extremely intractable how to keep children off their phones. I don't know if you'd agree with that. I'm sorry, I haven't lifted your spirits. But I do think, <laughs> sorry, to, 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 to say something positive, I, I think that cutting the arts, which has happened in England, I don't know about Scotland, cutting the arts in schools is a disaster. We, we need to have young people growing up feeling that they can engage physically with the world through making things and do not be stuck to their screens. Because the, the, the experience of something on screen is not haptic at all. It doesn't actually engage your memory or your, or your whole physical being in the way that, oddly enough, reading from a book does. The work of imagination as you hold the book actually does involve your senses more than the screen. And I, I mean, I certainly find that reading on screen, I don't remember, I don't retain it the way I t retain it if I've read it in a book. So I'm very keen that we ca lobby and campaign to keep music, arts, drawing, theatre, all these things as ways of actually expanding the mind. These are not luxuries. These are not um, ancillary, you know, add-ons for rich children to enjoy. This is the essential, essential needs of every child and should be their right to have that and you don't have to be good at it that's the other thing there's too much emphasis on people being good at things it's the pleasure of the process the, and the collective uh, collective activity together i mean a child dancing doesn't have to be a good dancer a child dancing can enjoy dancing so we have a question on this side of the room Uh, it's been fascinating. Thank you very much. Uh, one question just has, has come to me, listen to you, when you say you don't believe in fairies. Um, have, have we failed to grasp one of the most important message of, messages of fairy tales, the belief in, unseen, in the, the unseen world? I know, you know indigenous cultures all over the world for thousands of years have believed in spirits in trees and mountains and rivers. And perhaps if we had that belief, we might be better connected with our world. Uh, and I think I do believe in fairies. Well, I, I think it's not the same to believe in the spirit of a tree and a fairy, actually. I suppose when I was using not believing in fairies, I meant actually the, the wee folk, I mean, the actual embodied wee folk. But um, I, I agree with you, and I think it's one of the actual... Um, strands in fairy tale that is rather propitious for our times because in in fairy tales animals speak and and, um, and forests are sentient and uh, the there is almost no division between animate human beings and animate everything else i mean there are animate objects everywhere and um and it does actually show us reciprocity first of all it's not very hierarchical the, um, the, the, I mean, in Hansel and Gretel, a very famous fairy tale, a duck rescues Hansel and Gretel at the end and carries them home on her back. Um, so there's no, and there's no sense that the duck is any way kind of an inferior being to Hansel and Gretel. So, and so it's not hierarchical, there's an equality of nature. And then there is a respect, I mean, because there, is, there are constant transgressions in fairy tales which lead to disaster. You mustn't, you mustn't flout nature you mustn't you mustn't you know you you have to try and live within it it it, it, ca it carries an, a, an experience of people in the past who were dependent immediately on nature we've tried to sever that with our age of reason and our industrialization but of course we now realize that was a very mistaken course and we must return 
realizing that we do live as part of a web of natural connections and every filament of the web must be helped to, to exist or allowed to exist. And, um, but on the other hand, but I think that I, I'm not against people believing in spirits as such, but I, I'm not, you see, very frequently one of the developments of a belief in powers, subterranean powers or supernatural powers, is that the powers are, need to be placated. I mean, this is one of the fundamental structures of religion, that they might do you harm. And in order to prevent them doing you harm, you must fulfill certain obligations and acts. And in our Christian dispensation, those, those acts are sacrificial. So there's often a connection between believing in the spirit and sacrifice. Now, Christianity has not has stopped sacrifice being literal. Um, uh, you know, after Jesus' death on the cross, we don't sacrifice for real anymore, not animals or people. But uh, there is a sacrificial structure, which is actually quite different from Buddhism, for example. But these are very deep questions. So in Buddhism, where the world is animate as well, there isn't so much of a propitiatory, placatory relation to nature. Of course, ecology today and the ecological crisis has, in a sense, revived that, that feeling of threat, that there's very few ways that we can placate it by, except by reforming ourselves. I think we have time for, oh no, we, we're out of time for questions, I'm afraid. So we're, <laughs> we're almost at, uh, at, at five o'clock. Um, Marina, it has truly been a pleasure and a privilege for us to have you join us at the Winter Tales Book Festival. It's been a fascinating uh, conversation and uh, we're very grateful to you for your time and for um, all that you've shared with us. Um, just to say briefly to those uh, who are here in the room, um, so the, the next couple of sessions are with Val McDermott and then with Sally Magnuson. Um, those are ticketed events. Um, we do have a, a number of complimentary tickets here to honor those who have made their way here in the rain. Uh, if you'd like to stay um, for either of those sessions, then we have some tickets here at the front. Um, Jolene, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Okay. Good, but if we could show our appreciation to Marina. Thank you so much again for joining us. Thank you.